Hi, folks, this is Mr. Mega Man Fan. Like, share, comment, subscribe, yada, yada, yada. Here's the situation. I believe this is my Retroid handheld. And if it is, part one will be an unboxing, and then I'll have to let it charge for a while, and then we'll do the rest. And if it's not, this will be a very short video. But the packaging doesn't say Retroid anywhere on it, so... I don't know. It feels like it's the appropriate weight to be a handheld, but thanks to the nondescript packaging, I'm really not sure. And the destination it came from doesn't match the tracking that I had either. But 4PX is not a shipping service I'm familiar with, and they may have routed it through multiple different shipping partners, so... Anything is possible here. Let's find out. You and me, let's find out together. There are certainly warnings that make me think electronics, and it says made in China, which also would seem to indicate that it's the Retroid. Still have to get it open to confirm that. Yes, yes it is. And I'd like to give a shout out to Russ from Retro Game Core because he's the one who did a review of the Retroid Pocket and it's because of his review that I decided to take a chance on this. I chose the transparent black 4 gigabytes plus 128. So this is not the $99 model. This is the $119 model that's a little more upgraded and which Russ basically said you'd really want that over the $99 version anyway because it would have more power to run and play the things that you want to use so and now we can get a look at the inside of the box we've got this uh interface introduction sheet that shows the HDMI, USB Type-C, volume on and off, start select D-pad, ABXY, L3, R3, home, customize, return, and it has a 3.5 millimeter audio jack so you can actually plug in an old school corded set of headphones. Here are the stats, it's got a 1.8 gigahertz CPU, a 614 megahertz GPU, four gigabytes of RAM as noted, 128 gigabytes of storage as noted, a three and a half inch touchscreen, built-in Wi-Fi, which was a big deal for me because the only other handheld I have with built-in Wi-Fi is the Mew Mini Plus. It's got Bluetooth, HDMI, runs on Android 11, a 4,000 milliamp battery which should be quite beefy if I'm not playing any hardcore emulators and it weighs 200 grams okay nice that they included a spec sheet in there so let's get a look at this transparent black retroid it looks pretty nice you gotta say I like the color I like the feel kind of reminds me of a Game Boy Advance but not buttons feel nice d-pad is not too slippery I believe these are also the hall magnetic sticks as opposed to the switch joy-con ones that have drift I could be wrong I'd have to check Russ's video to be sure but they feel nice and we've got our charge cord right here and I think that's everything that's in the box so I'm gonna go ahead and give this thing a full charge and uh, get a little exercise while I wait and then we'll come back and I'll go through some of the features that the Retroid has. Stay tuned. 
Okay, I've got to imagine we're close to 100% charge by now, but let's see if I can determine that. If I can just, yep, 100%. So I'll go ahead and unplug this. And what we're going to do is going to be the stock Retroid experience. This is not custom firmware. Do I have to hold down the button for it to turn on or do I just tap? Let me try holding it. Oh, there we go. That is a bright screen, I'll say that much. And it sure vibrates like heck when you first turn it on. The sound is good. I'm impressed. So let's see what we got running on this bad boy. You will like it. Let's get started. I hope so. Select your language. Connect to the internet. Chicago is close enough to where I am. It's a touch screen, if I didn't already say so. That's a nice feature. If you don't need it, you can consider disabling it. You can still adjust this configuration later. Let's uh, just turn it off for now. Please choose to install. Huh, okay, let's uh, go with Citra. I believe that's for 3DS. Ooh, Dolphin. This thing really powerful enough to run Wii and GameCube? I guess I'd have to watch Russ's video again. Duck Station for PlayStation. Like, well, it certainly seems like they're suggesting it can run all of these things if they're including them all. But Steam? Can this thing run my Steam games? Man, I'll be super impressed if that's the case. I don't even know what OMW is, but I'm curious. Why are there two different versions of RetroArch? I, th I assume I want RetroArch 64-bit, not 32-bit. I think Scum is for adventure games. Series Sam, why not? Well, this might take a little bit. L1R1, the L2R2 feel like they're in good spots. The weight is comfortable. It, it just has a natural feeling in the hands. It doesn't feel like overly light or overly heavy. And there's a sort of curved indentation on the back that your fingers naturally wrap around it just it's very comfortably designed and i don't know if the camera is really putting over how bright this screen is in person but it looks really good i guarantee it looks better to me than it does to you but it looks great to me. It occurred to me moments after I stopped filming that I could just pop a micro SD card out of something else and pop it in here. So, Bob's your uncle. I'm going to take the one out of my Turbo EverDrive, put it in here, and that should give us some immediate access to some games. Always helps to have not trimmed your fingernails before putting a micro SD card into something. 
Now this was the point where I was starting to get mildly frustrated with the Retroid because I couldn't figure out for the life of me how to get rid of these on-screen overlays for the touch controls. Eventually I figured out that RetroArch has system settings to turn on or turn off the overlays, but in the meantime it occurred to me that maybe I'd want to do HDMI out from this thing, so I went ahead and ordered a Blue Rigger cable from Amazon. Not affiliated, not a sponsored link, just like their product. So for the rest of this video, what we're going to be seeing is the HDMI out from the Retroid 2S to my television, which has all my component inputs, as well as some of my other game consoles. It's become quite a useful TV, and one that I picked up at a thrift store for only 20 bucks. so it really has revolutionized this part of my game room. And now we're revolutionizing even more with the addition of the Retroid. Now the screen aspect is a little off here. It took me a while to find the menu option in the settings. It turns out it's under theater settings and I was looking in the wrong place, but I did eventually get that straightened out. If your TV is like mine, you'll want to choose native for the display resolution. Don't allow it to do custom or auto, just pick native and it will force it to fit into the screen correctly. In the meantime, it's not really pinching off enough of the screen display that we can't play a game like Junior Pac-Man, made by Pac-Man Plus, AKA Bob, from Atari Age. No longer available in the Atari Age store, sadly, but the ROM is not hard to find if you go looking for it, and physical editions do exist as well on the secondhand market. I have one that I bought firsthand directly from Bob, and this is a Atari 7800 conversion that I enjoy almost as much as the arcade version, perhaps even a little bit more in some cases. Plus, with this being an emulation device, you can do save states, load states, you could even enable cheats if you really wanted to. Not that I think you need cheats for Junior Pac-Man, I'm just saying the options exist. Now this may be a plus or a minus of it being an emulation device depending on your point of view, but with some of these games you're going to need to have the BIOS, the binary operating system of the device that you're playing, whether it's a console or a handheld, you'll need that BIOS to make everything run smoothly. PlayStation games, you definitely need a BIOS. Game Boy Advance, I don't know if you need it, but I've just found it tends to be more smooth if you do have the GBA BIOS. Just look on your device for the RetroArch system folder, and generally you'll put all of the BIOS files in there. And sometimes they have to have specific names, like if you download a ColecoVision BIOS set and they all have different names, like the year they were released and what country they were released in, whichever one you pick, you've got to rename it to ColecoVision.ROM when you drop it in the system folder. These are little things that can really annoy the heck out of you the first time you use RetroArch, and I'm not going to lie, they still kind of annoy me to this day. It's not exactly what I would call plug and play, but you're going to go through the exact same thing if you did this on a Steam Deck or a lot of other different portable emulation devices, so you just kind of put up with the hassles, but Sometimes I like standalone emulators better because RetroArch, my opinion, just mine, nobody else's, you don't have to agree with me, I feel like RetroArch is really bloated and bogged down with trying to do too many things at once. Sometimes it's just nice to have a standalone emulator like PPSSPP or Duck Station. It just lets you do what you want, where you want, for the one console that you want to play at that time. But if you like having everything in one place, RetroArch is good for that too. It's all up to you. And here's another pro tip. You're going to need a Neo Geo BIOS folder if you want to play Neo Geo games. And you're going to leave it in the zip file. And you're going to leave the games in the zip files as well. Don't unzip anything. Drop the Neo Geo zip in the system folder of RetroArch and drop all your Neo Geo games in one folder of their own. The emulator core Final Burn Neo can figure it out. It can pull whatever it needs to from the zip file, so don't unzip them. That's a mistake I made early on trying to set this thing up. Once I got it going in handheld mode, 
putting it into the HDMI input and playing it this way is just a treat. Especially considering this thing has Bluetooth, so you can pair any 8-bit dough, any Switch Pro, any Bluetooth type controller that you own with this device. I'm using the Switch Pro on it right now because my 8-bit dough Pro 2 is not charged up, but it's just, it feels just as good as if I was playing Metal Slug on the Switch, which I've bought the game. I bought the ACA version or whatever their arcade collection was called on there. I think it was ACA, but maybe Neo Geo was in a separate category of its own. I bought Metal Slug and several other Neo Geo games just for my Switch so I could have them when I take the Switch wherever I go. But now I can play them on here wherever I go as well. And that brings up another point I want to make about the Retroid. And this is one where I'm actually going to disagree with Russ just a little bit because he said the device didn't feel perfectly pocketable because the analog sticks, the hall sticks, stick out a little from the front of the device. Maybe I just have bigger pockets than Russ does, but if I open my front pockets wide enough and just let it drop in there, it doesn't snag on my pocket. It just slides right in. Now, if you had your wallet or your keys or something else in there, it obviously wouldn't fit. But if you're just putting it into a front jean pocket or a front shorts pocket of some kind, I think it's going to fit fine. And if that just worries you too much about messing up the sticks or scratching up the touch screen, then get yourself some kind of carrying case and put it in a backpack or a pouch or whatever. I mean, that's up to you. For me, taking it upstairs to downstairs when I go from the game room to the bedroom, not a problem. It just fits. Now, one thing that you might find vexing if you're doing this through independent emulators instead of running everything through RetroArch is that you might have to configure the controller for each individual emulator. Like I'm having to do right here with the Duck Station emulator, I had it originally set to the controls on the Retroid Pocket, but now I'm changing all of the bindings to the buttons on the Switch Pro controller, which... I'll have to change again if I do it with an 8-bit Dell Pro controller. So, if that gets old to you, then maybe you just want to play it in handheld mode only and not with TV output. Or maybe you just want to run everything through RetroArch and pray for the best. That's up to you. I'm not telling you how to enjoy your experience the best. And to bring things back around full circle now that I've got the native aspect ratio set, Let's go with Bonk's Adventure. I know initially in handheld mode I was doing Bonk 3, Bonk's Big Adventure, but it always feels good to go back to the classics. Now in this video, I'm not going into the super hardcore things that an emulator could or couldn't do. I'm not doing Dreamcast, PS2, GameCube, Wii, or any of that in this video. I'm going to do a follow-up video once I feel like adding a bunch of files to that. I have to make sure I have a big enough micro SD card or enough storage on the internal 128 gigabytes to support the file sizes I'll need for that. And I've given to understand that some custom configuration, you know, frame buffering, frame skips, may be necessary to get the best performance out of those as well. So I wanted to stick to the things that I knew with a fair degree of certainty that the Retroid Pocket would be able to handle. And it seems like 8-bit, 16-bit, I'd say up to PS1, not a problem. There could be some exceptions to that rule, but so far I haven't found them. It feels like everything just runs naturally, smoothly, at the right speed. You could always adjust the colors if you don't feel they're right. These colors may not even be right on my TV. And your eyes may see things differently than mine do, so you have to choose the color palette that's right for you, and customization is a wonderful thing when it comes to these devices. So, pick your color palette, pick whatever you like, and go with it from there. In conclusion, do I feel like the Retroid Pocket 2S was worth $119 plus shipping? Yeah, I would say I do. I feel like this is plenty powerful for the things that I want to run on it. It's comfortable, it's well lit, 
The sound out of the built-in speakers is satisfying. There's micro SD expandability through the slot on the bottom, so you don't have to just rely on the internal storage. If I can give one more pro tip before I go though, if you're using Windows, you may find that it's easier to make a connection to transfer files from your system to the device. If you're using a Mac, like I tend to do a lot of the time, you're going to need the Android transfer tool and you will want to get a nice cable. Like don't just use a USB A to C adapter cable. Those tend to wiggle around too much in the device and in the port. You want a USB to USB cable that connects directly from USB-C up here on the top to the USB on your MacBook and then use the Android transfer tool and your life will be much, much easier. Or you could just pop the micro SD card out and put it in an SD card adapter, put that in your SD card slot on your Mac and put all your files on there that way. But if you wanna transfer files directly to the internal storage, you'll need a good cord for that. So that's my last bit of advice as far as the Retroid Pocket goes. And this is a little bit of a luxury item, I won't deny that at $119 plus shipping. It's not gonna be for everybody with tax and shipping. It's gonna be more like $140 of a roundabout. But let's look at it in terms of comparisons. I feel like it probably does more than a Miu Mini Plus. And the Miu Mini Plus already impressed me at $69 plus shipping and all that stuff too. So this is beefier from what I can tell for 50 bucks more. And when you start comparing it to things like a Switch Lite that's gonna cost you $200 and can't run custom software or emulators unless you really know how to hack the hell out of it, and I sure don't. And then you're gonna get even more expensive when you're gonna go up to things like a portable PC, stuff that you would see on ETA Prime's channel, or a Steam Deck, which is gonna cost you $400, $500, $600. Then you're starting to see the value proposition when this costs 60%, 70% of a Switch Lite, and can play a lot more generations of systems that aren't in Nintendo Switch Online, then it really becomes a good value. Especially if you like to play your collection of games wherever you go, you can put this in a bag, put this in your pocket, take it with you. And I'd say the 4,000 milliamps really do last a good long time. I'm still on my first charge and it hasn't run down yet. Even with all the filming, with getting an HDMI cable, with leaving it in standby mode instead of powering it down fully, I'm still at 49% after doing all of that. So I like it. I'm not gonna say it's for everybody, but for me, I feel like it was $119 well spent.